And uh, Father, we just thank you for the way that Lillian has given her life to you and to, to those that she loves and even those that she doesn't love so much. Lord, that she, she is following your heart. And Lord, we just ask for a fresh anointing on her as she releases your heart to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so much. Wow. So kind. Very kind words they've said about me. Thank you guys. I appreciate that. I've known Ramesh and Elsie for many years and uh, I love how God puts people together and how he knitted us together and uh, we just have great times of sharing um, our hearts and uh, always have great conversations. And of course, you know, when you've got another prophetic person who's a prophetic intercessor like Elsie and we get into conversation, you can just imagine what that sounds like, right? Like, right? It's like, oh, I, I heard the Lord say this. And I, oh my goodness, that's exactly what I heard the Lord. My goodness. And we can go on and on for hours. But tonight we don't, I mean, this morning we don't have that much time. So I'd like to get right into the message. And um, I just want to pray uh, for those of you watching um, online or those of you watching us this morning, I just want to pray for you that as the Father releases these words, that there will be a shift in your heart and that you will have a revelation and an encounter, new revelation, new encounter for you this morning, that what you did not know before, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will leave this meeting today knowing that God has ministered to your heart and he has touched you. At the very beginning, uh, when we were praying for the meeting, I love a church that prays before they meet. Isn't that awesome? And the, the, the spirit was just moving among us. It was just beautiful. When we were praying, I got this word that there is somebody that's watching us this morning that has had such gripping fear in your heart. And I believe that that fear came from some things that your, your family has been saying to you. I don't know if it's your immediate family or relatives. And what's happened to you is that you became gripped with fear. And the, there was an opening where the spirit of death wanted to come and break into you, but Jesus has been praying for you in the heavens. The word says that Jesus is our main intercessor. He's seated at the right hand of God and he's making intercession for us night and day. And I want to say to that person this morning that God is with you and he has been fighting for you and he has come this morning to defend you and also to bring new revelation to your heart. At the end of this meeting, we're going to have some prayers and I know that God's going to set you free and he's also going to bring deep reconciliation for you and your family. So I bless you to receive this in Jesus' name. Wow, well, um, that's a good way to start a meeting, isn't it? When the Holy Spirit starts to move like that? Well, last night I had an incredible meeting. I had a meeting with a bunch of women that I am mentoring but three of them in particular are, the one, particular are the ones that God has said to me, I want you to handpick these three women, young ladies, and pour your life into them. So it's been a while that I prayed and God highlighted them to me and he said, these are the ones. So I've been giving up my heart and my time and my life into these young women and I love watching what God is doing in their lives. But last night I had a meeting with an extended group some of them that want to come alongside and want to grow in the Lord. They have careers, they have professions in the secular world, but their desire is to come into a deeper relationship with God, to know God in the depths of his heart, to know who he is in their lives. And last night we had a wonderful time together. Holy Spirit came in the midst of us and started to prophesy and to bring words of knowledge and they were all blessing each other. And as I started, as I looked around at these young ones, I started to think about a mentorship and what mentorship means in this hour. Today we have mentors and coaches for just about everything. You've got health coaches. I'm a health coach. Uh, you've got, you know, coaches that can help you in your career, coaches that can help you with, with, your, with your family, with relationships. You've got a coach for everything. So when we think about uh, coaching, and there are many websites out there, um, we, we, think about, um, we think about how that can complement our lives. 
I want to say that back in the day when I worked in the corporate world, I used to mentor many people and train them. But I used to do it from a brain perspective. It was brain to brain. But when I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, even after I knew the Lord Jesus Christ, I was still doing it in the same manner. But when I came into the knowledge and the truth and the revelation of who God really is to me, which I will share a little bit later on, I changed the way that I mentor people. It is no longer brain to brain. It is now heart to heart and spirit to spirit. When we think in the church of leadership training, when we think about mentorship, we use the template and the, and, the, and the prototype of Paul and Timothy. And with good reason, because it's very successful. When we read the story of Paul and Timothy and how Paul raised him up to become a bishop in the church, it worked for Paul and it worked for Timothy. For all intents and purposes, it's really a great model, depending on which angle from which angle you're looking at them and looking at this story. It starts out in a little town called Lystra. If you want to, you can go and research the history of Lystra, but right now for, you know, for a quick reference, Lystra is located in modern day Turkey. And it was just this tiny little town. And um, at that time, Paul and Barnabas, who were picked, handpicked by the Holy Spirit for the work of the ministry, were going on all of these mission trips. So Paul and Barnabas had visited Lystra at one time. And then on their second trip to Lystra, they met this young man, Timothy. And all those believers were saying to Paul, you have to meet this young man. He's just incredible. He's diligently, he's diligently seeking God and he's growing in the faith. He's just wonderful. You have to meet him. So it's long story short, Paul meets Timothy. And what does he do? He likes him. He likes his spirit. He likes who he is. He sees something in Timothy and Paul later on will reference to Timothy and he says, Timothy, the faith that was in your mother Eunice and in your grandmother Lois resides in you. You carry that same faith. Let's look a little bit at the history of Timothy. He was born to a Greek father and a Jewish mother. But throughout the, the scriptures, we do not know much about his father. All we know is that his father was Greek. And, um, and uh, we do not know much about how Timothy related to his father or whether his father was in his life at all. So here's the thing. Paul looks at this young man and instantly there's something that happens in Paul's heart. And he decides that Timothy, like you, yes, you can be a Timothy. Now, you know, the scriptures do not really give us a whole lot about his age. And some believe he's about 16. Some believe he could be almost 21. So let's just say he's somewhere between 16 and 21. Does that work for you guys? Yeah. Come on, yes. He looks at this young man. There's something that happens in his heart. And he's like, okay, Timothy, you're going to be my new intern. And I'm going to take you on some mission trips with me. Come on, do you guys love mission trips? Wow, we've been on some mission trips that's just been incredible. Elsie and Ramesh and, and I and Norman, we were in, in Cyprus. You remember that trip? Now, that's a fancy mission trip, but it was a good one. Um, but anyway, so Paul decides, I'm going to take this young man with me on these mission trips. Kind of reminds me of our senior, um, our founding pastors, John and Carol Arnott. I remember the days, you guys may not know, but when working in the offices and when John and Carol would work out of this office, they would take young interns with them and John would take them on all of these trips. And they would come back and they would be in awe of all the miracles and the signs and the wonders that God had done and how John had ministered. And that's what Timothy experienced with Paul. Come on, who would have loved to have been at Corinth and seen transformation, conversion? Whoa, I would love. We almost made it to Corinth from Cyprus, right? Close to Greece. We, who would have loved to have gone to Macedonia? Ephesus, oh my goodness, I would love to have been at Ephesus in the day of the early church. And this is what Timothy experienced when he traveled with Paul. But here's the thing, if you're looking at, from, at them from a different angle, is Paul his mentor or what else is Paul being to Timothy? Let's look, what's that? Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Ramesh. 
That, can somebody please pass that, uh, that doctorate over to Dr. Ramesh for us? How do we know this? Let's look at the scriptures. We start in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 1 to 3, but I'm going to focus on verses 1 to 2. It says here, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God, our Savior, and Christ Jesus, our hope. To Timothy, my true son in the faith. Come on. What mentor calls somebody their son? I mentored people. I wouldn't dare call them my son or my daughter. You need to be politically correct in today's world, right? Paul breaks, breaks with all, all of those customs, and he says to Timothy, my true son in the faith. Why is he calling him a true son? If you have an adjective that prefaces a word, a noun like that, we need to pay attention. Paul is saying he's true. He's a true son. That means that Paul must have seen the fakes. And he must have had experiences where people followed him, but they did not. They did not turn out to be true sons. But Timothy certainly was. And Paul says, grace, mercy, peace. Come on, grace, mercy, peace. Can you guys say that with me? Grace, mercy, peace. Ramesh and Elsie were praying about peace just before we, you know, after we took communion. Where does grace, mercy, and peace come from? This is what Paul says. From God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. From whom? From God the Father. Do you guys know who Paul is? Do you know who he was? Where did Paul get a revelation that God is our Father? This is the guy who was standing there when Stephen was, was stoned to death. This is a guy who went and grabbed Christians from everywhere and brought them back to, to Jerusalem to make lion food out of them. Is there any endearment in his heart? Where would Paul have gotten this? Paul was not there when Jesus talked like in the book of John, when Jesus said, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. I came from the Father. I'm going back to the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Paul wasn't there because he got saved after Jesus went to be with the Father, after his resurrection. Where did Paul would have received this? There had to have been a transformation in Paul's heart through his journey with the Holy Spirit. This time where, where Paul is meeting Timothy, it, it says somewhere it's, it's about 15 to 17 years after he had been converted. And Dr. Ramesh can, can um, confirm that for us. He is endearing. There is a softness that's coming out of his heart when he's talking to Timothy. There are only two of the people that followed Paul that he called dear and true sons. It's Titus, and you can find that in the book of Titus in, in, verse, in chapter 1, and Timothy. I want to say that, you know, there is so much political correctedness in, in our lives today that we sometimes pass over what we're feeling in our heart and when we feel the Father and the Holy Spirit move upon our hearts, we bypass that for poli political correctedness. Can I say, can we stop that? And can we just move with the Holy Spirit and, and with the heart of the Father, grace, mercy, and peace, right? I used to work in the um, downtown Toronto in the CIBC Tower before I came to work at Catch the Fire and joined the team here. I was a, a PR manager and I worked for a global international HR firm working in the financial district with the banks and, and financial uh, companies in, in the downtown core. I had one, uh, a young lady came from a head office to our office at Bloor Street in the tower, my high tower, where I worked. And uh, I remember that day we were working together and I'm just communicating with her back and forth. We're looking at our database, we're looking at files and different things. I, I just want you to know, I'm, I'm feeling Paul's heart. Whenever I see a young person, a young lady, I have two biological daughters and I have a third daughter. And whenever I see young women, I put my daughter's shoes on their feet. Do you know what I mean by that? I look at them through the eyes of my own daughters. And this young lady was there and we we're just going back and forth and talking, whatever. And at some point, I just turned to her and I said, oh, sweetheart, can you please pass me that? Because I say that to my daughters. I go, oh, sweetheart, or I say, sweetie. That's what we call them, sweetie and sweetheart. And I said that to her. She didn't say anything to me. The next day, uh, she went back to the, our head office, and she filed a report against me that I had used condescending words to her, derogatory words, calling her sweetheart, and I was not keeping with HR rules in terms of how we ought to communicate with one another. Thank you, Jesus. Paul was not politically correct because he got delivered from that on the road to Damascus. Amen? 
Okay, so <laughs> let's keep going. How on, um, when did Paul, um, sorry, I got myself all going there. Um, cultures, the culture that Paul came from, you know, I get all, I get all under the spirit, right? And I just got to shake and then I kind of lose my thought, my train of thought. So somebody keep me on the straight and narrow here. Let's talk about Paul a little bit. How would Paul, how would Paul have a heart of a father? We know a little bit of Paul. We, we actually don't know a whole lot about Paul's father, but based on his history, we know that Paul's father would have possibly been a Pharisee like Paul. Paul said, I will, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. That means his father would have been a Pharisee. And he, Paul is a Roman citizen. His father would have been a Roman citizen as well and given that citizenship to his son. But in that kind of culture, there was a great focus on education. And Paul's father sent him to boarding school to the esteemed Rabbi Gamaliel to study under him, right? Paul, in that, in that context, would not have had that relationship and that intimacy with his father because it was all, the focus was all about education and higher achievement. And we know who Paul was before he got saved. So how in that culture would he develop a father's heart? I want to say to you that it came through conversion and it came through revelation, and it came through transformation. That's the only way that we get it inside of us. My childhood, can I tell you a little bit about myself? You guys wanna hear a little bit about me? You're okay. So I'm number five out of five girls and one boy. I'm number five descending. I was born into a family where my father was a very strapping, handsome man. Can you tell? Um, anyway, strapping, yeah. My father was a, a professional, anyways, an engineer for Caterpillars and uh, worked with the, um, with the rum, rum industry and the sugar industry, right? And uh, anyway, I was born number five descending of six children to my mom. My father had two mistresses on the side. When I was born, I don't ever remember my father hugging me. I don't ever remember my father loving me. I don't ever remember my father holding me. I don't ever remember my father whispering sweet things in my ear. I never remember my father being loving and kind to me. My father was absent a lot and went to hang out with his mistresses. And whenever he was around, I was not, I was not visible to him. And when I was six years old, my father had a brain aneurysm that led to a massive stroke and he died. And I had no paradigm and no grid for what it was like to have a father who loves me. My older brother at the time, who was much older than, than me and my other two little sisters, stepped into that role and took on a father's role, just like Paul does for Timothy in this story. Are you guys still with me? Yes? In 1999, I come to Catch the Fire. I moved here from Quebec and made Catch the Fire my, my home church. I'd been coming to visit. And in 1999, I'm sitting in this room here, and John Arnott is on the stage, and he's speaking about the Father heart. And he's talking about this loving Father in heaven who loves us. And it didn't matter what our earthly fathers were like, that this Father in heaven loves us unconditionally. And as he's speaking, I'm getting a download into my spirit and I start to shake and shiver. And I'm thinking, first of all, I have no idea what you're talking about, John Arnott, but I want it. I want what you're offering. And in that moment, I started to weep. I started to cry and I got the revelation in my spirit. And it didn't happen overnight, guys. Every time I heard the message, it went a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper. That's how the Lord takes his spirit, his heart, and imparts it into ours, a little bit at a time, little by little. I wanted to, uh, there are so many references here where Paul demonstrated the heart of the Father for us, but I want to focus on just a few points. What happens? Paul is about to take Timothy on these mission trips, but you know these religious people, right? They always got something to complain about. I'm sorry, um, no, none of you guys, none of you, okay? 
But the people started complaining. The Jewish people are complaining. What about Timothy? He has a Greek father. He's never been circumcised. How can he go and serve in ministry? Come on. Have you ever heard that before? Well, they don't qualify and they don't qualify because they haven't done this, that, and the other. It's not about what you've done. It's about the father. So they start complaining. And what does Paul say? He says, okay, great. I'm going to take Timothy and have him circumcised. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 9.19, he says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win many as possible. That's why he did that for these people, and he had Timothy circumcised. I want to say to you that in the, in the ancient Jewish um, culture, it is the father who arranges for the circumcision. It is the duty of the father to book the synagogue on the eighth day after the child is born and to make sure that the moil shows up and performs the circumcision. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It is a father's duty. Paul stepped in and demonstrated to Timothy, I'm going to show you the heart of the father by being a father to you in this way. Also, in an ancient Hebrew culture, if you adopt a child, adoption was very popular, not popular, but it did happen. And if you adopted a son, according to he, old Hebrew laws, that son becomes like your son and you also need to ensure that he's circumcised. I am drawing some points here to show you how Paul stepped into the role of being a father. The father of all fathers, Abraham, was the first one that God made a covenant with through circumcision. The father of all fathers. So there is a fathering that happens in circumcision. And I believe the Holy Spirit used this situation so that Paul could demonstrate the heart of God. In Ephesians 1 and 5, it says, we, he predestined us for adoption to sonship. Paul adopted Timothy. It, what, he wasn't just a mentor. He adopted him. Adopted him. And, and the scripture says, we, he predestined us for adoption to sonship to Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. Do you know it's a father's pleasure to bring us into him and into his heart? He gets so much pleasure out of us, even when we're being mischievous and when we eat too much chocolate. Another thing is um, Timothy, uh, uh, Paul was so concerned about Timothy and he was so observant of what was going on in his life. He says to him, Timothy, I know that you've been going through some, some um, digestion upsets. You were talking about digestion earlier and I was just smiling when you talk about digestion. You know, when we take communion, it heals our digestive system too. Paul says to him, Timothy, you haven't been really well and I know you're having some issues with the digestion. He says, take a little wine to help it now and then. I went, now a mentor doesn't really care about these things, right? But a father does. I did some research to find out the spiritual, Christian spiritual reasons for gastrointestinal pain. And it says, in fact, most gastrointestinal system diseases problems are caused by fear, anxiety, stress, not having peace in your heart regarding issues in life. Not having peace in your heart regarding issues in life. Who would have known what Timothy suffered in those days? People knew that his father wasn't around. Do you know in back in those days, a Hebrew woman and a Greek man getting married is a mixed marriage? It certainly was. Nothing like today's mixed marriages. But it was in those days. Timothy must have been teased. The kids are like, where's your dad? You have no daddy. You have no daddy. He takes us into his system, into his gut. And he goes away feeling less than. This is probably what was happening to him when he was a little boy. When I was a little child, I told you, in the first five years of my life, I was actually failing to thrive. I was born sickly and very, you know, very spinely, like not a lot of weight on me. I didn't walk very well at the beginning. I would lose my, my, my rotator cuffs would fall out and my father would just smack them back in because my bones were such, they were in such bad, in, in a bad state. I was so thin, I didn't eat a lot, not because we didn't have food, I just didn't have an appetite and I didn't have a desire to eat. It was so bad that they nicknamed me Marasmi and they said they didn't even know if I was going to survive or if I was going to be healthy. Check me out today. Woohoo! Uh, thank you, Jesus. But um, at that time, guys, I suffered with all kinds of digestive issues. 
I cannot tell you the whole long story. I've had a lot of deliverance, but out of it came, I was angry at my father because I didn't have a father who loved me. And out of that, I carried it in my gut, in the innermost being, inside my, my digestive system. And for most of my life, I presented with issues with digestion until I got the revelation of how much my Father in heaven loves me. And I had deliverance prayers and God set me free. But can I say to you, even today, sometimes when I have moments where I feel abandoned, abandonment was a big issue for me. I would feel abandoned and I would feel alone. And I feel like nobody cared about me. I go through that sometimes. I have an awesome husband. Elsie and Ramesh know him. Uh, but there are times that for whatever reason, I would go through that. I guarantee you when that happens and I start to feel abandoned, my digestive system starts to act up and I pray and then I get a release from it. Um, Timothy was truly a son. Do you know why he was a son? He was a son. In that time that he was being raised up into leadership, Timothy carried Paul's bags, all the scrolls that he had in his bag and his feather pen. He would go and fetch the coffee, the lattes. We didn't have Starbucks. They didn't have Starbucks back then. He'd have to go make the tea for Paul. He would wash Paul's feet when they were dusty because Paul was raising him up as a father. You see, when you are being offered the spirit of sonship from a father's heart, there needs to be a response from you. There's a synergistic exchange that happens. The father fathers you, but unless you respond in the spirit of sonship, you don't, you don't get it. And you don't, you don't, you don't achieve what God really has planned out for you. You wanna be a leader? Be a son. You cannot be a leader without being a son and knowing that you're a son. I'm not saying you cannot all over, but what I'm saying, you're more, you a, a, a spirit-filled leader knows what it is to be a son. Yeah. Sons become friends with their father. That's what happened with, with Paul and Timothy. There was such a beautiful intimacy between them. Do you know what Paul said to Timothy? He says, you know me so well. There was such an intimacy that they had between them that was so healthy. You know, in today's world, we have so much estrangement between fathers and sons. I hear stories. I, last week, I had somebody sit and, and, and bewail to me about the estranged relationship between him and his father. And I, I was able to minister to him. But Paul and Timothy were so close. The intimacy was so beautiful. Paul said to him, you know me. In, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, you know what I teach. You know how I live. You know what my purposes in life are. You know how I love. You know my patience. You know my endurance. There's an intimacy that needs to happen between us and our Father in heaven. That is what Paul was doing. He was demonstrating to Timothy, this is the intimacy that the Father is longing to have with us. And he wants us to turn and say, yes, Father, I receive it. I receive the, the, the father heart, the love that you have for me through this intimate place. In, um, in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 19, it says, I have no one like him. Paul saw Timothy as that very special son to him. He had no one else like him. Do you have anyone that says that to you in your life? I have no one like you. Well, God is saying that to you this morning. You are so precious to me. I have no one like you. You're all exclusive. We are all God's favorite. You've heard that before. It almost sounds like a cliche, but it is the truth. We are all God's favorite. The other thing that Paul does for Timothy is he affirms him with a word that is going to take him through his lifetime. Here's what he says. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. Timothy, my son, I am giving you this command. He says, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well. Can I read that to you again? Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so by recalling them, you may you may fight the battle well. What is he saying? 
Paul is the person in the New Testament that affirms the prophetic in us. He brings a whole demystification to the prophetic so that we start to learn to understand that when a person stands in front of us and words come out of their mouths, it is not them that's speaking the word. It is coming directly from the heart of the Father because he wants to bring encouragement and he wants to give us the, the, the template and the blueprint for our lives and he wants to help us to walk out our lives in the fulfillment that he planned for us. So he's saying to him the prophetic words. What is he saying? You see, Timothy would have been ordained at some point. All the brothers gathered around him and they ordained him and they poured oil over him and they blessed him and all of these prophetic words came from the father into Timothy's heart and Paul comes to today and he says, I want you to remember those words because the purpose of the prophetic is to encourage, it's to build us up, and it is to show us the heart of the Father so that we can take those words, and as Paul says here, it will help you to fight the battle well. The prophetic is, is for many reasons, but it helps us to fight the battles of life. It is the weapons of our warfare for the battle of life. We need to make declarations of ourselves. Um, last year, I had Emma Stark um, prophesy over me. And I remember, remember I told you, I do get those moments of insecurity and abandonment and all of that. And I must have been having one of those um, that day. Or maybe she saw in the spirit something I had experienced. And she said to me, the Father is saying to you that every day you need to stand up and look yourself in the mirror and say, I am the woman for the job. I started doing it. I, start, I listened to the prophet and I started doing it. And you know what? It has built me up from inside out. That is the heart of our Father in heaven. He wants us to use the prophetic words. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I love summer. I love 32 degree weather. It's beautiful. Come on. Yeah. The, <laughs> I love the prophetic because it is power for us. And it is God himself demonstrating love into our hearts when he speaks through another human, human being through the prophetic. And what Paul is saying, don't you forget what those brothers spoke over you. Don't you forget that day when we laid hands on you and we declared that you were going to be a bishop and you were going to make history in this world. You were going to be one of the most remembered apostles and disciples of Christ above all others, above many others. Because Paul is a big one, right? And then there's John the Baptist. We can't forget about him. But we're not talking about him today. Paul is affirming Timothy to remember those words and to use them to help him to fight the battle well. Guys, if you have not had a revelation, I know you, some, of you, some of you are watching and you're saying, oh, I've heard that message before. Well, you haven't heard it like this. And you haven't heard my story. You haven't heard it like this before. Every time we hear the message of sonship and the father heart, it is always impacting and it's always different and it always leads us into new revelation and conversion and encounter with Jesus. So today, if you guys have not had that revelation before, if some of you are feeling, you know, like me coming from that culture, I couldn't talk about my heart. I couldn't talk about how I felt as a child with my father's reputation in the, in the community. I couldn't talk about the pain I suffered. It wasn't until I came into a revival church and started to embrace revival values and learn about God as a father. And so many of us, we keep it hidden inside of our hearts. And we go through life. You know, it is sad sometimes I minister to people that are in their 60s, 70s, even in their 80s, and they say, I couldn't talk about it. There was too much shame wrapped up in it. There was too much fear wrapped up in it. How could I say that my father never loved me? It happens. Your earthly father may not have loved you. But I want to tell you this morning, your heavenly father loves you beyond measure. Beyond measure. Unconditionally. Exactly the way you are. He loves you. And today, he wants to circumcise you. I'm sorry if that makes you guys feel uncomfortable. But read your Bible, okay? He wants to circumcise your heart. Not the Old Testament circumcision with the covenant of Abraham. He wants to circumcise your heart today. And he wants to impart to you 
a new revelation of how much he loves you. Can we take a moment? I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes if that's okay. And just take a moment. Let Holy Spirit come and minister to you right now. Earlier I said I felt that there was someone that was going through such intense fear. And I believe that as you hear this message today, that the fear is lifting off of you. I even see it. It's like, it's like smoke just, you know, just emanating up into the atmosphere and it's coming off of you. It's coming off your shoulders and it's going far away from you because the father this morning is ministering to your heart and he's saying, son, I love you and I want you to know that, but I also want you to respond to that. When you respond, it activates something in the spirit realm. You, today, the Lord wants you to know he's adopted you. In the natural realm, adoption is a legal acquisition. In the spirit realm, adoption is a spiritual acquisition that brings spiritual blessings. And today those spiritual blessings are yours. I see a heart and it's got this jagged line going through it. And I believe that the Father wants to heal your heart. You have had so much wounding in your heart. I believe it's a young lady. And you've had so much wounding and you've said, that's it, I'm done. I'm never, never, ever, you've said never, ever, ever going to believe that anymore because that has not been my life experience. But today, the Father is saying, it's that day of the never, ever, ever because today I'm going to heal your heart. I just want you to receive what I'm offering to you today. Just receive the love of the Father. I had to go through that. I received it through John Arnott. And then I received it through many others, through impartation and through revelation. So today, from a wounded little girl with marasmi to a spirit-filled, delivered daughter of the Most High God, one who loves her Father in Heaven and knows she's loved, I want you to receive that impartation today. Today, the Father wants to heal. And you know, it's interesting that I was talking about digestive disorders. And I believe that some people here that are watching or someone in this room, I believe there's somebody in this room right now, you have been having fear and anxiety that has affected your stomach, your digestion, and you've been trying to, to bypass it and say, oh, it's nothing, I'll take a little Tums and it's gonna feel better. But there is something, an issue of life that you've not dealt with, and that's causing the pain in your stomach. I want for you to engage with Holy Spirit right now. Take a moment, come on. Just say, Holy Spirit, that's me. And I'm asking you to come and heal my heart. And as you heal my heart, may my body follow. Come, Holy Spirit, come. I believe the Father is doing a lot of healing this morning. Whatever your issue may be, Whatever your pain may be, whatever your wound may be in the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, I want you to take a moment and receive from the Father right now. Yes, Father, I receive it from you. I believe that as you come into that response of being a son and a daughter, that your body is going to follow and healing will come to you. Healing will come to you. Just receive it. Keep receiving in Jesus' name. Keep receiving. Keep receiving. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Rabba Sita Namashanda. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much, Lillian. Just take a deep breath. Let's just breathe in his love for us. Sometimes it, it has, uh, you know, we, we want the Father's love, but we just, we don't know how to actually get it. Well, if I've been given a gift, I just say thank you. And in that saying thank you, it becomes mine. And so let's just, let's just thank him today for his incredible love for us. You know, some of you, um, you've known God's goodness in your life, but uh, he wants you to know his goodness like every single day. 
You, you think it's something that comes down the road. But today is your day. And in fact, don't let a day go by where you don't encounter his goodness. And part of that is just stopping and saying, thank you. And your feelings will begin to follow. And you'll begin to sense that he's close. So, um, Lord, we just thank you for the meal that you've put before us today. And Lord, help us to digest the things that you're saying to us individually and also corporately. And, um, and Father, we just pray right now that your keeping power would rest on all of us as we go about your business throughout the week. Lord, let your peace rest on us. Deliver us from our enemies and make us a blessing and a refreshing to those who cross our path. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.